Welcome, everybody, to Adventures in Law. We're on air every second uh, Tuesday at 12.30, and we're going to be speaking to people who, uh, who have practiced law or gone to law school and uh, done, uh, gone on to do other things. And we're also going to be speaking to lawyers who still practice law and uh, still enjoy what they're doing. Today, we're just thrilled and honored uh, to have uh, Ian Hanna Mansing uh, with us for our debut. And as everybody knows, uh, Ian is the anchor of uh, CBC National News and host of uh, Cross Country Checkup. He won the 2008 Gemini Award for Best Canadian News Anchor and the 2016 Canadian Screen Awards for Best National News Anchor. Am I right on that? Yes. So it was the same. So they changed the name of the award over time. So that's why. Same category, different sounding awards, eight years apart. So You won it twice, though. Yeah, but so I guess I, I win it only every eight years. So here's, <laughs> here's hoping for 2024. All right. So Ian, one of your colleagues from uh, law school phoned me up the, the other day, uh, Jim McCauley QC, <laughs> and he was telling me that it was going to be a daunting task uh, interviewing the interviewer. <laughs> and I said, I am very worried, Jim, about dead time. <laughs> and Mr. <clears throat> McCauley QC said, with Hannah Mansing, you never have to worry about dead time. Which is a polite way of saying I talk too much, but that's okay. <laughs> right. This is our, our uh, debut. Uh, we have over 200 registrants, I mm -hmm. think 240. Um, I was so pleased to see uh, that number of people. I thought it was about me. <laughs> and then I learned that it wasn't about me at all. It was because you're on the show. It was a bit of an ego hit, but, <laughs> uh, but I'm pleased you're here. Welcome everybody to Beyond uh, the Bar. Let's uh, have some fun, uh, Ian, and get right down to it. You grew up in New Brunswick. You uh, went to Mount Allison University mm -hmm. and apparently were on the debating team. I was. And yeah. won a national cha championship. I did. Do you remember what uh, your favorite debate was? Well, I, one of the things I remember in that debating tournament is that the final topic was about hate laws. And uh, you just kind of arbitrarily get put on one side or the other. And I was on the side that argued that we shouldn't have uh, hate laws in Canada. And at that time, at least I felt we should. And one of the nice things about debating, and it certainly helped me in law school, was being able to take a position that you didn't necessarily agree with and be able to try to convince judges and the audience uh, of your side. So, yeah, so I remember that part of it. And I remember the, I'll tell you, and I, like debating is such a great thing to do because you have these judges in front of you, you have the other team there, you have some people in the audience and you don't have a net, you know, you're just there and you're speaking. And if you can survive that, you can pretty well survive any environment where you have to speak publicly. I'm curious for you, for a guy who has conducted trials, who has been in, uh, in discoveries and, you know, dealt with lots of clients, what about, like, here we are with these cameras, we have an on-air light, we have some people just beyond uh, the camera. How is this feeling for you? You know, that's what the big problem was that Mr. McCauley said to me when he said I'd be interviewing the interviewer. He said, you watch, Rose, because the interviewee <laughs> is going to be interviewing but you. But I am curious, how are you feeling? Well, I'm feeling wonderful okay. that we have you on. Oh, okay. And I'm, uh, we're blessed to have you here uh, today, okay? <laughs> and for particularly the first show. Okay, so you um, apparently you were trending before anybody was in the gaming industry. I understand you produced some game when you were younger. Yeah, so I did a so I created a board game. Uh, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, board game. Yeah, so in the in the 2000s, and uh, it was to be honest, I, I kind of stole a few ideas from various board games like Monopoly, and there was a game I think called Face Off years ago. But I'm a big hockey fan, and uh, and with a friend we developed this this board game, and we sent a, a letter to the NHL asking if they would license it, and the NHL replied in about three days. I was shocked at that, and they said absolutely you could. The terms were really comfortable. And so, yeah, we started cranking out this board game. It was always more a hobby than a business, but it was it was neat to walk into 
Zellers at the time, Walmart, and actually see our game on the shelves across the country. So it was kind of a fun little side project. How many years ago was that? 2005 till about 2008, and it kind of petered out. And like I said, we, we treated it more like a, a hobby. So the good side about that is we didn't lose any money. Um, the bad side is I think that if we put a bit more time and maybe a bit more money in it, it probably might have spun off and become something viable, but it was, it was still fun. All right. So let's get right down to it. Mm -hmm. And you went to law school. I did. You went to Dalhousie. Mm -hmm. And Dalhousie seems to me from everybody I've met, it's friends for life when you go there. Mm -hmm. And everybody loves the school. But apparently you only applied to one school and an envelope came and you never opened it. What was that all about? So who told you that? Oh, I've done my research. Uh, you know, that's the similarity between journalism and law. We've got to do our research. Yeah, so that, that's actually not many people know that. So that is actually very interesting. So I did my undergrad at Mount Allison, which is uh, in my hometown of Sackville, New Brunswick. And I was working in radio all through university. And by the time I was ready to graduate from undergrad, I knew that I wanted to be a broadcast journalist. But at the time, I graduated in 1983, which will seem like an impossibly long time to some or all the people who are watching. Um, we were in the middle of a huge recession and interest rates were, you know, mortgage rates were beyond 20 percent. Uh, it really seemed like a bleak time economically. And so I thought to myself, not a bad time to maybe stay in university for a few more years. Plus, my parents, honestly, were not th thrilled about the idea of me being a broadcaster. Uh, and so I thought, you know what, maybe I should apply to law school. And so I did the LSAT that worked out well. I, you know, had the marks I knew I could get into or thought I, I mean, who knows, but thought I could get into law school. And so I was not a very adventuresome person at that point in my life. And so I didn't want to go too far away from home, but I wanted to go to a school that you know, had some kind of, uh, they drew um, students from across the country, kind of a national school. So Dalhousie and Halifax was the, the perfect combination of being close to home uh, in a city that I felt was a manageable size, but also I knew would have students from across the country. So I applied to it, didn't have a plan B, and, uh, and then got the letter of uh, acceptance. And I'm trying to figure out how I knew it was a letter of acceptance. Maybe, maybe I got a phone call as well. But what I do know is I never did open that original envelope. And as a result of that, I didn't go to uh, the uh, orientation dinner party that they had set up for students because I, I guess that information was in the letter. And interestingly, one of the people who was at that uh, dinner was uh, another, well, there were students there. Uh, but one of them was a student who I wouldn't actually get to meet for maybe another year and, you know, eventually became my wife, who was a longtime lawyer here in Vancouver and now works in management at her firm, McCarthy Tetro. Uh, so that delayed our relationship by at least a year or maybe gave me another year to mature. OK, so you were unsure about law school. Yeah, I mean, you know, and I should say, you mentioned at the beginning the categories of people you'll, you'll be talking to in this process. Yes. I'm actually in neither of the categories you mentioned. I'm in the third category where I didn't practice law ever. Yes. I didn't uh, article. So I went to law school thinking to myself, I, really for, for two reasons. Well, three, I guess. One is kind of deferring entry into the real world because it was a pretty uh, daunting world at that point because of how tough the economy was. So there was that. Uh, the second thing was I thought maybe I will enjoy studying law and maybe I will want to be a lawyer. And in the world that I had sort of inhabited to that point with debating and that sort of thing, it did seem to be a natural progression. Um, but the third thing is I thought even if I didn't practice law, and I kind of felt like I probably wouldn't practice law, I thought a law degree it would be a good yeah. thing to have. Yeah. And here's the thing, like when you're 21 years old, there's a lot you don't know. And there are a lot of decisions you make that are naive. That decision actually turned out to be uh, quite like a good one because even to this day, all these years later, the things that I learned in law school are so applicable to yeah. the world of journalism. Yeah, I wanna ask you about that. Uh, uh, Ian. But what I was when I was preparing uh, for this, I wondered what it would be like going through law school when you really didn't know that that's what you wanted to be, because there's so much hard work involved. So 
How did you manage that? <laughs> I could just see you in discovery when you're really ans asking the question that you know the answer to. Um, so, you know that moment, I assume this happens at every law school where they tell you, and they probably still do to this day, tell you that in first year they're gonna scare you to death, second year they're gonna work you to death, third year they're gonna bore you to death. And I remember when somebody said that to us and we were in first year and we were scared and I couldn't imagine ever being bored in law school. And so sure enough, first year we were frightened and, you know, did we belong? Could we survive? And turns out we could. Second year, you know, just all this reading you have to do and all this work you have to do. Um, and then by third year, I was sure at that point that I wasn't going to practice law. I was actually sure at that point I wasn't even going to article. And so that made third year more onerous for me than it would be for a lot of other people because it's kind of like, okay, I just want to you know, finish this year and get on with uh, my broadcasting. Do you remember what it was like making that decision? Um, you know, I, I have to say, I, I don't actually think it was a decision. I think the decision would have been if I decided to pursue law. Like I, I love broadcasting and I was lucky enough to get these fantastic jobs in undergrad. And then when I went to, to Halifax, uh, I eventually got a job at a radio station there. So it, it, it just always seemed like the natural progression for me. So, I mean, there's a lot of young uh, lawyers listening to the mm -hmm. show today. And is there anything you'd want to say to them about going to law school and not being sure that that's what you want to do? Yeah, I mean, so I, I should preface it by saying this was an easier thing to do in the 80s than it is to do these days, right? Because tuition was not that expensive. And so I, I wasn't digging a huge hole from, a, not really a hole at all. Tuition was so inexpensive that I could basically cover it with money that I was earning from, from jobs that I had. Um, but I would say that, uh, I guess, you know, actually I, I back up and say another thing. One of the reasons I went to law school, kind of weird when you think about it, um, was because of Ken Dryden. And people may not remember who Ken Dryden is, but he was a superstar goaltender for the Montreal Canadiens who had a law degree, who actually took a year off in the middle of his career to article. Uh, but he used to talk about, uh, you know, wanting to live in these two worlds of of hockey and law, even law school. And I remember I thought, you know, that was that was pretty impressive. And I did enjoy um, having these kind of two lives, both, you know, working in radio and and, and going to law school at the same time, that was interesting. Um, I would say to, to people who, who are watching, who are thinking maybe of a different career or wondering about, uh, you know, what to do with their, their law degree, the, the one thing to keep in mind is we run into people, like there were a bunch of people actually that I work with who not only have law degrees, but worked as lawyers, like Dan Getz, for example, who uh, worked at CBC and then he went to UBC Law School and then worked as a lawyer here in Vancouver for a while, then is back now at CBC. Um, but it's, it's not easy to go from the practice of law into journalism just directly like that, right? You need to now go to a, a journalism program somewhere like BCIT or UBC and get a little practical experience before you, you get into it. But I'll tell you, all the, the discipline of law, the breadth of knowledge that you learn in law school, um, and presumably the things you learn in the practice of law, though I didn't do that, all make for really good journalists. Let's talk about some of your experiences, uh, early experiences mm -hmm. as a journalist. Um, one of your ma first major assignments was the um, Exxon Valdez oil spill. Mm -hmm. And environment obviously is a big thing today. And maybe you could just uh, tell everybody what that was like to see that spill. Yeah, so this was uh, March 24th, 1989. I was, uh, you know, a young reporter. And all of a sudden we uh, are told that uh, we have to go to Valdez, Alaska. I didn't even know really where it was. And uh, we, we went from Vancouver to Seattle, Seattle to Anchorage. When we got to Anchorage, we discovered that we couldn't get our equipment on the small planes that flew from Anchorage to Valdez. And so a guy named uh, John Blackstone, I think his last name is, a Canadian who worked for CBS in San Francisco, saw us at the Anchorage airport and saw how downcast we looked. And he said, you know, what's wrong? And we told him we can't get our equipment on this. And he goes, well, CBS has a Learjet here. I'll, I'll lend it to you if you want. 
So we, we put our equipment on CBS's Learjet and uh, that's how we got to Valdez. So that was, so, you know, I tell that story because it just, it was also eye opening to me. It was a world that, that I couldn't imagine that, that I would be in. Then we arrive in Valdez, Alaska. It's, it is the middle of March. The, there's snow everywhere. It is breathtakingly beautiful. And it also was a little bit surreal to know this oil spill had happened and yet see no evidence of it anywhere. And the second day we were there, I uh, chartered a small uh, fishing boat and the camera operator and I went out to where the Valdez, uh, the Exxon Valdez was. And so, and it's just, I mean, not coincidental that the Exxon Valdez is named after Valdez, Alaska. Coincidental that the freighter that would spill all this oil was the freighter named after Valdez, Alaska, because of course there are many other freighters that, that ply the waters there. Um, but anyway, we got closer and closer to, to the, the ship that had run aground, and then you could start smelling the oil. And yet at the same time, none of the oil had come ashore. And so everywhere we looked still looked beautiful. And it was kind of, you know, you knew that there was this environmental time bomb, but it hadn't, well, it, it definitely was underwater, but it hadn't hit the shores yet. And so it, there was a sense of, uh, of surrealism in those first few days after the oil spill. And then we came, so we were there for a week, and then we came back about six weeks later, and by then the shores were coated with oil, this thick oil, and of course uh, animals were dying uh, in huge numbers. Did that shape your views of the environment in any way as you, as you struggled? I mean, I don't, I don't think that event necessarily shaped yeah. it. I think probably it was shaped more by being in British Columbia, right? Like that's the thing I, I noticed coming out here in uh, the late 80s is how even then so many people in this province were so aware of the environment. So many people here, you know, go camping, they, they you know, go hiking the West Coast Trail. So there's a real close connection um, in a way that even though growing up in New Brunswick, like a, you know, fairly rural province, I, I don't think we were as, like, I, I don't, I, at least in my friend group, not as connected to, uh, to the wilderness as people in BC seem to be. Okay. You've covered major events, mm -hmm. you've covered the LA riots in 1992, both Stanley Cup riots yes. here. Hey, not only did I cover both Stanley Cup riots, I may, I'm, I'm one of very few people who actually saw each of those riots start. I was at Robson and Thurlow and at Georgia and Hamilton in 1994 and 2011, and I saw the exact moment each of those really? riots began. You covered something very devastating, the Humboldt, Saskatchewan mm -hmm. bus crash mm -hmm. killing 16 young Bronco hockey players. You covered part of the Missing Women's Commission of Inquiry. Mm -hmm. So which one of these um, uh, events was most difficult for you personally, if at all? Yeah, I, do, I don't think that, I, I don't remember any of them being particular. I mean, obviously, like, like in Humboldt, for example, uh, we were at the rink. So, so the Friday night that the crash happened, I was in the studio in Vancouver. And we heard that there had been some sort of crash in Saskatchewan involving a junior hockey team. But for hours, we had no more information than that. And I remember saying to uh, the group of people on the newscast, um, you know, I think we need to prepare our audience for uh, bad news here. Like, I forget exactly why I felt that way, but we didn't know how many people had died, but I felt like it was going to be pretty significant. That was Friday. So the next day I headed to Saskatchewan and I remember arriving at the rink and you know, you could just, I mean, I guess some of it is we were projecting it, but you could sense the weight of the tragedy. And you, we could see for, I walked by the cars in the parking lot that belonged to some of these teenage hockey players who had driven to the rink and gotten on the bus for the kind of trip that junior hockey players take all the time. And of course, never could have imagined that they would never be coming back. And then parents were coming in through a back entrance going into the dressing room. Imagine what that was like for them, again, as their son's equipment would be, well, they would have taken some of it, but some stuff was still hanging in, in the lockers. So, you know, you, you definitely feel the intense weight of that story. So, so yeah, so all of those stories that you mentioned um, come with versions of that kind of weight. 
the LA riot uh, was incredible because we all we got there that night, the night that the riot had uh, had had broken out. The you know there were still fires, there was still chaos. We were walking around in places. I mean, George Garrett, the legendary reporter here for CKNW, got uh, punched and had I think his rental car stolen. You know, we were very aware that that uh, you know you had to be really careful. Um, so all of these stories have certain levels of weight to them, but none of them, I don't think particular, you know, I, I, you sort of just get used to doing these stories. Yeah. And, and that's one of the similarities that I, when preparing for this, that I realized and maybe incorrectly about law and journalism is maintaining objectivity. Mm -hmm. As lawyers, oftentimes we get too close to a case, particularly in family law. And you tend, you may lose your objectivity. Are there any secrets that you've learned how to keep your objectivity, how to not allow some of these devastating things that you've seen affect you personally? Well, I'll jump ahead and say I, I think there's a school of, of thought within journalism right now um, that feels like uh, you don't, maybe you shouldn't even be striving for that objectivity. I tend to be of a different school of thought where I think objectivity is important. I understand philosophically that we bring to every one of these stories our life experiences and obviously, you know, our perspectives. And so there, you know, I remember being a, giving a speech one day years ago and somebody said to me kind of smugly, you know, you talk about objectivity, there is no objectivity, everybody's biased. I said, well, sure, you know, if this was a first year philosophy class, I, I agree with that. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't strive to be as objective as possible. And to that point, you know, my dad, I remember as a kid, always played devil's advocate when we had conversations around the house. And, uh, and uh, you know, and he didn't teach it to me as a lesson, but I learned it as a lesson. And, and I've always thought when I work on a story, how, does it, how would I feel about what I'm about to say or the question I'm about to ask or the clip I'm about to put in a story? How would I feel if I was on the other side of this topic? Which is one of the skills that all of us lawyers have or should have, mm -hmm. is knowing what the other side is thinking, or what their position is, and what, what they may ask. In 1998, and this, this struck me as some time ago, uh, Ian, you covered a live special on drugs on the downtown east side. And, and it's two decades later, and I was thinking the other night, probably not much has changed since then. And, and probably, homelessness then and now has not changed that much except it's greater yeah what do you what is that what do you think about that that nothing like that has changed in 20 years yeah so two things i'd say about that first of all as a guy who moved here in 1988 so didn't had only been to vancouver once before i moved well that's not true visited a few times but anyway didn't know vancouver till i lived here and then as an outsider basically seeing the downtown east side back in the 90s was shocking and i would say to people back in toronto like you will not believe this there is no place like this in toronto or montreal or any other place i've been to and we need to do something on this and so we did a huge amount of research and uh and 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 we ended up deciding to do a live special now the downtown east side so many stories have been done now it's kind of hard to remember back then that uh that it was a bit different in terms of coverage and it was a pretty big deal when we did this live show from the downtown east side and uh and at the time there was a a, a crisis because there were there was a pure heroin or the, the, a lot of people were dying of heroin overdoses in in the late 90s and so uh the, the timing was appropriate for doing this special and and then to your point you know all these years later and i think about this all the time when i'm when i'm walking around there or driving through there is how the problems haven't been solved but i i, I can tell you this and and i'm sure a lot of people who who are watching this realize it uh there are a lot of like dedicated, well-meaning people in British Columbia working in good faith to try to do what they can to uh, uh, ease the problems of the people and the suffering in the downtown east side. And, and, you know, I remember when Mayor Philip Owen, who recently died, um, started arguing for uh, harm reduction. 
you know, and, and I mean, I think uh, Mayor Owen was a fairly small C conservative guy and, and he understood and embraced this idea that we're not going to solve anything by criminalizing uh, people who are dealing, you know, who are using drugs in the downtown east side. I remember in 1998 being with a couple of police officers and they took a crack pipe from a young girl or a young woman and uh, crushed it uh, under one of the officer's heels uh, as an act of compassion, they thought at the time. And then a few years ago, I was talking to another police officer, maybe five years ago about that. And he said, you know, we wouldn't do that. Like, why would you take that from her? And, you know, and yet we so and yet we still have this problem. And I think what it tells you is, is it's the intractable problem of, of drug addiction and mental illness and poverty. And, you know, there is no easy solution. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people in the last 35 years have spent a lot of time at least trying to ease the, the suffering that people are dealing with. Yeah. Which leads to the next question, uh, Ian, for the criminal lawyers uh, out there, or young lawyers thinking of being criminal lawyers, and I'm gonna talk about another award. In 2005, you were awarded from the Department of Justice and the Canadian Bar Association, an award for excellent in, excellence in legal uh, journalism based on a show called Crime on the Streets. And it was actually a live broadcast from a federal penitentiary in uh, Manitoba. Mm -hmm. The awards panel said that they were impressed by your knowledge um, of the law. Okay. So did law school or learning the law inform you in any way in that kind of broadcast? Oh, for sure. Absolutely. It has Can many, you, many times. Yeah. Can you tell everybody out there what, how that happened? Okay? Yeah, I mean, I'd say two things about that, that uh, project. The, the first one is, like, I care a lot about, uh, the, about criminal justice. And I've covered a lot of trials and I've had the privilege. One of the things about this job is you get to see things firsthand. And so, you know, one of the things I tell people is I've seen three ex-premiers in British Columbia acquitted of criminal charges, uh, at least two of whom weren't guilty. <laughs> and so um, it was. Uh, so, yeah, you get to see all kinds of things. And, and, and one of the things that frustrates me, and I've talked to lots of lawyers and lots of uh, judges as well, um, what frustrates me is the misunderstanding people have about the, the system. And, and one of those things is how often have we heard people say judges are soft on crime? And so I wanted to do a special where we kind of took that on. And so one of the things we did, and I've heard other people have done versions of this as well, but at the time we felt it was an original idea, is we got a group of people together. One was a, a, a Reform Party supporting person from the Fraser Valley. Um, another one was a former police chief from uh, Calgary. Um, and there were a couple of other people as well. And, and we, we gave them the basic facts of the case. And we said, what sentence do you think a judge handed uh, down in, in this case? And they all uh, guessed a much greater sentence than was the actual one. And so then we gave them a little bit more information and said, okay, now based on this information. Anyway, in the end, they all came very close to what the judge had decided. And, and the point of that exercise was, you know, when you hear the two lines, people blame the media about this, but, but you know, I think it's human nature. You know, here's somebody who's, who, who killed somebody else, um, and, the, and this is the sentence they got, and there's outrage. And, I mean, part of the outrage is that people don't know the facts of a case, and part of the outrage is there's never going to be a sentence that's going to be equal to the fact that somebody's life was taken away. Anyway, so that was part of our, our show, it's, it's our project. But the other part of the show, we sat around a table beforehand and we said, what could we do to really make this show different and special? And I said, I'd love to go inside a penitentiary and to do something live from inside. And so we knew that Stony Mountain Institution had let the media in before, not to go live, but at least in there. And so we contacted the warden and said, could we do a live program from here? And two or three weeks later, he came back to us and said, yeah, you can. I thought, incredible. And I'd never been in a penitentiary before in my life. And so walking in there was quite extraordinary. And we ended up going into cells, talking to people who knew their families were watching live on television. I remember walking down the, the range at one point, the cell block, but they call it the range, uh, and interviewing a guy and asking him uh, about, uh, you know, what he had done, which I guess you're not supposed to do when you're in prison, but 
I was only there for a couple of hours, so I thought I'd be fine. And then he talked about it, and then we heard this, this, this pounding. And what it was was inmates in the floor above who were watching the show live and who were uh, you know, letting their either support or disfa- dissatisfaction be known mm-hmm. by pounding their feet against pounding the like floor. Pounding like in the movies, like yeah. you see in the movies? Yeah, it was incredible. Was and that so, frightening? It was, it was intimidating. I had a friend who worked at a, at a penitentiary in Nova Scotia who I went to high school with send me a note afterwards and he said, you know, fascinating program. You look scared sometimes. <laughs> did and, you did your uh, views change at all on incarceration after I, no, talking I, I, to these inmates? I, I, I don't know that they changed. I think they just underscored how I felt before, which is, I mean, you know, it sounds trite to say, but not everybody understands this. They're people, right? And I mean, some of them have done some terrible things and some of them, you know, like even the context of their lives doesn't change the fact they did something terrible. But at the end of the day, the people we talked to anyway were people. I was thinking about the similarities between journalism and the law, mm-hmm. and I, I wrote a couple notes down. I, I don't know if they're correct though. Uh, writing, researching, and investigating, importance of evidence-based stories, search for the truth. Are those proper similarities between uh, what you do and what I do? I mean, I hope so. Okay. Right. I hope so. Yeah. And and I think in you know in journalism, there's all kinds of different journalism and and there are the investigative reporters who spend months on a story right they're a different breed of journalist and they they end up becoming advocates for you know the the or crusaders i guess for the cause yeah. that they're investigating that's not the kind of stuff that i've done i've i've always enjoyed kind of quick turnaround uh you know spot news stories the the earthquake the the, the riot, that sort of thing is kind of what I've enjoyed. But, but in, in those situations, you know, you're in, in with speed, you're trying to get to uh, the bottom line. But, you know, I, I see what's on your desk there. The pandemic was definitely yeah, a very different story. Uh, Mr. Hannah Mansing's uh, book called Pandemic Spotlight. Yeah, so you, you, I didn't ask you to put that there, but you did. I'll just say that uh, uh, the, the pandemic has been unlike anything any of us have experienced in our lives, right? And, and certainly from a journalism standpoint, never have I seen a story that has affected so many people. And I'll do a quick plug for the book because all the proceeds go to UBC's uh, uh, medical school, so I don't get any money from it at all. But it, it profiles nine infectious disease docs, and uh, like Isaac Bogosh, Lenora Saxinger, people that hopefully some of you have seen in the media. And, uh, and it just talks about their experiences during the pandemic. When I read it, I, it came across that you really cared about these people, yeah. these nine doctors, wholly respected them, really cared about them, and found them to be exceptionally brave professionals. Yeah, I mean, listen, it, first of all, in, in, in media, it's difficult for us often to get experts to speak on television uh, because either they're <clears throat> reluctant to do it or there's a culture in their profession where people look askance at the person who goes on television. Police officers, for example, toughest thing to get retired police officers to weigh in on on stories. So let's say a use of force story like uh, the death of uh, Jakansky at the Vancouver airport. There's a really important story where you need police officers or former police officers to help you understand what what police did there. Very hard to get them to speak. Um, Lawyers, often very difficult to get. I've had lawyers say to me when I say, I would love to do this interview, I'm not an entertainer. And it's like, we're not looking for an entertainer, you know, but anyway. Um, And then these infectious disease doctors, there are nine of them who just made decisions independently that they wanted to come forward and be available to us to answer questions. And they still do. And you know, all the the bitterness, the anger, the division that this pandemic has created among some people. These doctors are, are getting those emails and those tweets and sometimes death threats as well. Yeah. And they continue to uh, answer our calls, even though, I mean, you know, it doesn't change their business practices at all. Yeah. And that's where the bravery comment came from. That mm-hmm. These were brave individuals that you interviewed. So the, the pandemic has changed law in the law in many ways, clearly the process of law. What about journalism? 
Has the pandemic had an, any effect on journalism? Yeah, I mean, I, I think in, in terms of like, and, and the workplace as well, right? Like all those people who thought you have to be in person to do things <clears throat> suddenly realize that you can do things remotely, like the people who are watching yep. right now. The fact that in terms of work, uh, you know, before the you, you couldn't be uh, a legal assistant and stay at home in Coquitlam all day. You had to come in uh, to work and, and do the stuff in the office. And lo and behold, for two years, uh, all of a sudden you don't have to do that. In journalism, uh, you know, you, you have to go and do the interview in person until you don't. And then we discovered we can actually get somebody on their laptop, wherever they are, and do the interview via Zoom, and that works. You know, So yeah, so it's, it's changed things a lot. Much the same as in law. Yeah. And probably much the same as in other professions, yes. uh, too. You know, being an ethics advisor at the Law Society, that's one of the things I wanted to ask you about is, is ethics. And are you able to tell us what the important ethics are in journalism? I know in law, candor and responsibility to society and honesty and objectivity. Those are all important ethical values that we have. What about in journalism? Yeah, I would say that probably the two biggest differences that I've seen in journalism in the 35 years that I've been practicing it are, uh, f first of all, the, the ethics discussions, you know, the journalism standards and practices. We're dealing with that all the time. And then the other one is diversity. Uh, in terms of really opening up the process to hear different voices, right? So you asked about ethics. We have uh, a journalism standards and practices uh, department at CBC, and it is constantly weighing in on how we do stories. So for example, during the, the invasion of Ukraine, when there are pictures of bodies, let's say, you know, and, and how do you handle those on the air? Um, when some Russian soldiers had been captured and there were pictures of these soldiers walking along and, uh, and is it ethical for us to show their faces as prisoners of war? And so we're having these conversations all the time. Sometimes they're debates. Sometimes it's just guidance from the people who are in charge of the journalistic standards and practices. But we, we discuss these things in a way that uh, we rarely did 25 years ago. Okay. Uh these days, particularly in the law profession, maybe in other professions, uh, uh, mental health and wellness have come to the mm -hmm. fore. And in fact, we've recently had Mental Health Week uh, for lawyers and all sorts of people that we never thought uh, would come forth. Came forth about yeah. uh, depression and feelings they had growing up. So tell me, when you find yourself overwhelmed, which you must sometimes, or stressed out, how do you handle that? Yeah, I, I mean, I haven't. You know, I, I haven't felt uh, stressed, uh, well, stressed out for sure. Uh, but I was always somebody who really loved the, the stresses of the job. Um, and, you know, it is an incredibly stressful job in terms of the, the deadline. You know, like if, if something big happened right now and I had to file for the national tonight, we're on at 10 o'clock Atlantic, six o'clock Pacific, and there are no extensions. I was a guy in school who always asked for extensions, but in real life and journalism, there are no extensions. So there's that. There's secondly, the fact that your product is going to be seen by, by the people who are watching it um, side by side with your competitors. So if you say, I couldn't find a, that person, and then all of a sudden CTV has that person, you know, your failure is writ large. And, and then there's the performance aspect. You know, you, you do what you do and some people like it, some people don't like it. And especially in the social media world, people are able to tell the world they don't like it. And I love all those things. Like I'm the person, shockingly, I'm sure for those of you watching who didn't see a microphone they didn't like when I was in high school. Um, I love deadlines. And, uh, and I love the sort of a, the excitement of the live part of broadcasting, all of which is to say, so I haven't, I haven't had like overwhelming stresses at work that were negative, but I will say this, we were, inc and I'm sure this is true in the practice of law as well, we were incredibly naive about the mental health impacts of the job. And we are no longer that way. And we do have people who, I mean, our reporters in Ukraine, I was talking to one the other day, the stuff that, that she saw is like nothing I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and again, 25 years ago, and this is true of police officers, it's true of lawyers, it's true of doctors, and it was true of journalists. It's just like, you know what, buck up. Like just, you know, just deal with it. And if you can't deal with it, then get another job, which is 
stupid, right? And now that's not the case. And we do have the, the, uh, the emails that I'm sure lawyers get as well about your EAP. We have an uh, yeah. employee's assistance program yeah. and we're told to use that. So yeah, More and more, yeah. uh, we're talking openly yeah. about that. And, Absolutely. And I think, and that's one of the things that I realized when I was reading Pandemic Spotlight was when you were interviewing the doctors, we hadn't even come to a place yet where the mental health impact of uh, COVID had uh, uh, become something that everybody knew about yeah. but at that early time. Yep. And probably you could do a new book now yes. with the same authors about the mental health impact. Absolutely, especially I think in, so this book, I, I finished kind of gathering information for it by May of last year and it, it was published in the fall. And then I thought, if you think back to like sort of January of this year, to march the convoy, like the deep, deep divisions, the anger that people had, I'd be curious to know what impact yeah. it had on these doctors. Yeah. Now, in terms of chilling out, which you probably don't have a lot of time to do, about five years ago on CBC Now or Never, <laughs> you know where I'm going with this? I don't actually, no. Are you worried where I'm going with yeah, this? No, I'm not worried, no. <laughs> you, I feel like I'm in good hands. <laughs> you said you were overdue on the grouse grind. Oh, how has that worked out? I, you know what? I, I, <laughs> I've not done the grouse grind. I, uh, I, so I play ball. So this fall will be 30 years that a group of us have gone to UBC every Saturday morning and played ball hockey. I love it. It's, you know, and, 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 you know, I, I run hard if I'm chasing a ball, playing ball hockey. Uh, I don't run otherwise. And I am intimidated by the grouse grind. Have you done the grouse? I did. It took me three hours, uh, Ian and that's, that's good, isn't hours. it? Yeah. No, no it's 30 good? minutes. The person I was with did it in 30 minutes. No. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was one of the most embarrassing um, <laughs> athletic or non athletic moments. Have you only done one. it once? I did it once. Yeah. Uh, it, I was embarrassed. I thought I was in good shape. I thought I was athletic. All of that was wrong, okay? Anyway, so I have not done the grind, okay. but, uh, and I'm not sure if I ever will. I want to talk a minute about, uh, again, directed to some of the younger viewers out there. Uh, the younger generations see or don't see news or watch news in a much different fashion yeah. these days and on uh, many different platforms. So how do you see, for example, your show, the CBC National News at Night, changing in any way in the future? Yeah, I mean, we are in a period of unprecedented change in media. And, you know, things always evolved. Like we went, I'm old enough to remember when our family didn't have cable, right? So we had two channels and then cable was only another five or six channels. And then CNN comes along and does this wacky thing of all news network that, that would never work, except it did. And that changed things. And then the VCR and the PVR, and I'm going through all of these because all of them upended the way we watch things, right? I mean, even like the PVR was unbelievable. You could just press stop and go and answer the phone and come back and then continue w what you were doing. But none of us, I think, was prepared for streaming and how streaming did turn everything upside down. And so now there are more shows than any of us can recount. Whereas you and I grew up in a time where you go to work or school and people either watched Happy Days or Canon the night before. It was like oh, one yeah. or one choice or the other, right? Yeah, I won't be admitting to any of that <laughs> uh, right so, now. But. So, you mean we can ta start talking about Fonzie? Yeah, well, exactly, yes, absolutely. So, so the thing is, is that, uh, so now in terms of, you know, there was a time when 10 o'clock meant that you know, a couple of million people would stop what they were doing and turn on the TV and watch The National. Yeah. Well, that clearly isn't the case now. You know, people expect news when they want it. They get it on their phone. When there's, you know, video, you hear there's video uh, around. In the old days, you'd have to wait for the news to watch it. Listen, in the old, old days, there were afternoon editions of the newspaper, you know? And uh, it just seems crazy now, especially when most people don't even read on paper the morning edition of the newspaper. And so we don't understand in the business exactly where things are going to be in five years or so. Sure, younger people are not watching the news, but younger people never really did watch the news except for the news junkies. But the question is, the people who are 30 years old now who are not watching television news, we, we knew 20 years ago that when they got older, they would eventually you know, fall into that lifestyle. Now, I don't know. And so we tried, you know, our, our newscast is available online. We have a YouTube channel. 
Um, you can watch individual items, uh, but we still haven't really made that switch where the same number of people use, who used to watch a newscast are now uh, you know, consuming in the same numbers the stuff online. It's very fragmented, right? I just talked to somebody the other day, I was doing research on a story I was doing, and I just said to her, by the way, you know, do you watch the news? And she grazes a little bit in the morning on her way to work, but then after that, it's all based on social media. And if there's a tweet that she finds interesting, she may link to the story on there, and it may be on CBC or maybe somewhere else. Uh, that's the world she lives in. She doesn't watch the six o'clock news. She certainly doesn't watch the 10 o'clock news. I am uh, going to get in trouble if I don't ask some of those rapid fire sure. questions I talked about. Are you ready? I'm ready. I promised you they'd be harmless. Yeah, they but, will be but harmless. they don't have to be harmless. But I want to ask you what your favorite food is. My favorite food. I, I have very I have a very unsophisticated palate. So on the one hand, I went to Vidge's last night for my wife's birthday dinner. So, you know, I like going to nice restaurants. But but you know what? As a as a former Haligonian, I yearn for a Donaire. Have you ever had a Donaire? Yes, I have. Yeah. Yeah. What about your favorite song of all time? Favorite song of all time. So it took me a long time to finally be willing to admit publicly that I love ABBA and the Bee Gees. So I would never admit it before, but now I do. And now with Spotify, you know, speaking of how things have changed, yeah. you know, I sit there with my iPhone and headphones listening to Spotify and unfortunately usually go to a playlist filled mm -hmm. with 70s music. Mm -hmm. So if you were to devote your life to philanthropy, mm -hmm. what cause would it be? Boy, that's really interesting. Like I, my wife is fantastic at uh, at being very mindful of of supporting charities, yeah. and through her, uh, you know, like she's a far better person than I am. Well, I should yeah. tell the audience that I know your wife. Yeah, she is yeah. wonderful. And and you both were family lawyers that's right. uh, uh, years ago. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I I have to say, and this isn't really the sort of best answer. But then again, Donaires and ABBA weren't the best answer either. Um, I'm hoping to connect a couple of things in my life, debating and my interest in the criminal justice system, to try to create some kind of uh, project that encourages kids in public school, because I think private school kids get these opportunities, but kids in public school, some kind of debating project or tournament or something that's on legal topics that, uh, that uh, you know, improves the level of debate, provides opportunities for kids in public school, and also increases understanding of the criminal justice system. And I keep putting off doing this because I'm really without a deadline, I'm lost. Um, so I don't want to say I'm running out of time, but I'm kind of running out of time. I, I need to do this. But I was going to ask you what inspires you. It sounds like that would inspire you. Yeah, I think that would, I would love to like, devote some time to that. Okay. Now, We've invited the audience to have some uh, Q&A. Excellent. And uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions if I may. We have a few minutes left. Sure. Okay. What's the best piece of advice that you have ever received? And what would be your advice to a newly called lawyer who is unsure about the practice of law? And that's a great question. Thank you very much for asking it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think back to my dad. My parents are alive and well in New Brunswick, going to go visit them next week. And, you know, my dad was a, a guy who said, so, so really the, both answers come from my dad. The first one is, you know, do what you love. Now, having said that, I remember when I told him between second and third year law school, that I wasn't going to article because I was going to be a broadcaster. He did blurt out, are you going to be a DJ the rest of your life? <laughs> so, you know, like do what you love, but ideally what you love is something that makes your parents happy. Not really, do, do what you love. But the second thing he said, and I, I, I do think this speaks to the second question uh, that we just heard, is, is he, I remember, like I, I went to law school right after undergrad and I started working right after I graduated from law school and I was in a hurry and he said, don't be in a hurry. Take your time. He goes, you're going to be working for a long, long time. And it doesn't feel that way when you're 22, 23, 24. Now, I know for younger people now, there's more comfort with taking your time and doing different things than in our generation. Uh, but, but yeah, you know, even for me, and I love my job, I really do. Uh, and not everyone's going to be lucky enough to love their job. But even for me, uh, you know, I, I look back and think, 
why didn't I take that year and go to France? You know, why didn't I try something a little different here and there? And so I, I, the thing I noticed, and I don't know if it's still the case, I feel like it may even be more so the case because law school is so expensive. I remember in law school seeing a bunch of kids who were smart, had done well in undergrad, had done well in their LSAT, ended up in law school. No parent looked askance to you know, their kid being in law school unless they were doctors. And, uh, and then they get a job as lawyers and you know make pretty good money, it's pretty prestigious, and then all of a sudden, for a few of them, they're in their 30s and they're thinking, is this really what I wanna do? Like my wife loved the life of law and it worked out really well for her. You did obviously too. I just say that you know if you don't love it, you got a lot of years ahead of you. And, and you just uh, hit one of the reasons for this show. Uh, and that is, what do you do if after a number of years in practice, uh, your experience was more, what do you do when you're in law school? Mm -hmm. But what do you do after a number of years in practice if you're just not loving it? Yeah. What, what should you be thinking? What process should you go through? I mean, I, I, you know, I'm not the expert on that. Obviously, I wasn't in that situation, but I guess I would say, I mean, let me answer it very quickly in two ways. And I touched on the first one before. If somebody's thinking about journalism, uh, in, the, in one way, you can't just kind of stroll into that world. It is so different than the world of law. Uh, it's good if you go to, let's say, BCIT and get a little, get a taste of, you know, do you really want to do it? But here's the other thing. There are so many ways to practice journalism now uh, on an entry level, like to do a podcast, to, um, to edit video yourself, to, uh, you know, there are things you can do and see if you like it. I interviewed Seth Rogen a few years ago, and I said to him, what do you say to a young person who wants to be the next, next Seth Rogen? And he said, do funny stuff, you know, create videos, go to, uh, to the comedy club, just do it. See if you like doing it, see if you're good at it um, and learn about it as you do it. And so I'd say the same thing in, in my job. And, uh, you know, there are ways to go out there and, uh, and do stuff. I mean, look what you're doing here, right? You're creating programming. And so people can kind of dabble in that and see if it's something they like. Yeah. I'm gonna leave uh, this show and in, in, we'll leave in a few minutes. There's a couple more questions, but one thing that I'm always gonna remember, Ian Hannah Mansing, is that you put me in the same generation as you. <laughs> I'll well, always true. remember that, okay? <laughs> Tell me something, there's, there's another question. Uh, in any of your work, in any of your journalistic work, have you seen any uh, discrimination in the, legal, in the legal system in Canada? Discrimination in the legal system in Canada. I mean, yeah. I mean, from my limit, so this is not a definitive answer yeah. by any measure. I mean, from my limited view of the legal system, I have to say that I've seen people who have been incredibly, um, uh, what would the word be, just like uh, very aware of, of treating people fairly, right? Yes, like, yes. Has there been discrimination? No doubt there has been, right? Yeah. But I have to say the, the parts that I've seen have been people who work really hard to treat people really fairly and really care about yeah. that. Yeah, another question, a good question. Mr. Hannah Mansing, do you have any advice for a newly called lawyer who is curious about journalism or photojournalism how difficult is it to break into? And, and good question, thank you, thank you for asking. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it is difficult. I think, you know, in terms of photojournalism, the good thing about that is you can just do it and submit stuff, right? And iPhones are unbelievable. Like, you can actually, you know, so uh, you, you can take broadcast quality pictures and video and then post it or submit it and, uh, and, and before you know it, like you could actually be doing that as something that you get paid for. Um, in terms of the journalism part of it, really the, the, the pathway now into journalism is usually by going to a school uh, and then getting an internship. But I would say this, if I were a lawyer interested in the world of journalism, one other potential bridge is to make it known to local TV stations or other journalists that you're willing to, to comment on things, right? And, 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 you know, do a little bit of, like you look at it like Dr. Isaac Bogosh, right? Most people probably recognize the face and name. I mean, if he wanted to be a journalist, we'd open the door in a, in a heartbeat, right? Because yeah. he's shown yeah. that he has the skills. Yeah. Uh, you've been inspiring oh, for you. me, yeah. I hope for the audience. Thank you so much. I've never thought I would interview you with the scales of justice behind <laughs> you, uh, Mr. Uh, 
Hannah Mansing, and thank you for getting the show off the ground uh, today. In, well, thank in a, you for inviting me. It's been in fun. A, in a very big way, okay? And You're going to hold my book one more time? Yeah, I'm going to hold your book up, <laughs> and I'm going to do two things so I don't get in trouble. I'm okay. going to hold your book up. There you go. Pandemic Spotlight, Canadian Doctors at the Front of COVID-19 by Ian Hannah Mansing. All money going to the UBC Medical School. All money donated to UBC, and I want to uh, thank your wife, Wonderful night, Nancy. She is why I'm here. She delivered me to the show. I know show. she did, and, yeah. and I knew that. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you in two weeks, I hope. We are going to have on the show Larry uh, Posner, the master and esteemed uh, uh, attorney in the U.S. on the art of cross-examination. Wow. And uh, it's free, and you get CPD. So see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you.